put us on the one that's got yeah. kind of the piece of aluminum. Yes. All right, good afternoon. Just make sure this is on there, it sounds good. Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Jeff Healy. I'm from uh, McMaster University in Hamilton, Canada. And I'd like you to welcome everyone here to a really interesting session, uh, which uh, should entertain beyond just a, a really good sandwich and a uh, chance to sit down for a few minutes at a busy meeting. Uh, we're gonna talk about atrial fibrillation and stroke uh, with a different spin, uh, looking more at the policy and advocacy side of this. And this is a, a really important um, issue across uh, Canada, across North America, and indeed the world, uh, when we start talking about policy uh, guidelines for things such as uh, drug-based therapy or even screening for atrial fibrillation. So uh, this uh, should be an interesting uh, talk that you've not seen before, and uh, you're fortunate to have uh, some very uh, well-known speakers who will come and join us and bring with them uh, their experience uh, in this field. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Trudy Loban, who's the uh, founder and CEO of the Atrial Fibrillation Association and uh, the founder of the Arrhythmia Alliance. Uh, Trudy's been involved for many years looking at policy, advocacy, uh, patient perspective and patient input into uh, this uh, field of atrial fibrillation and stroke. Uh, Valeria Casso is coming to us from Italy. Uh, she is a, a stroke neurologist who um, is going to talk to us about the overlap uh, between cardiology and stroke and, and neurology and how we can uh, work that interface between these two specialties to uh, maximize patient outcomes. And then finally, Patrice Lindsay is our uh, Director of Systems Change in the Stroke Program at the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada, uh, which, <clears throat> as you might imagine, is uh, deeply involved with policy uh, uh, making and, um, and uh, rolling out uh, both scientific data, but also policy and guidelines changes uh, throughout uh, Canada with respect to stroke prevention. So with that, uh, I'm going to start uh, talking a little bit about the scientific background and how things are evolving in terms of atrial fibrillation related stroke and how we might prevent that. So without any further ado, uh, just give you the usual uh, legal slides here. Uh, and here's our list of speakers uh, that I've already mentioned. So first of all, I'd like to do two th three things. I'd like to review uh, the need uh, for preventing AF related strokes. That probably doesn't need a lot of explanation to this group, uh, but clearly it's a, an agenda where we can have a major impact uh, on patients in our, uh, in our countries and under our care. I want to share a little bit about the best practices uh, across the world in terms of AF policy and advocacy, uh, and as you'll see, uh, there has been some evolution in thinking in this regard over the last uh, several years. And then discuss some approaches how we can progress uh, along this path towards better uh, prevention of AF-related stroke. So there are my disclosures. So first of all, atrial fibrillation is the most common heart rhythm uh, abnormality uh, seen worldwide. It's a, a leading cause of stroke, and in fact, the leading cause of stroke among people over the age of 75 years old, and somewhere between 15 and 35% of all strokes are felt to be due to atrial fibrillation. Um, patients who have an AF-related stroke, as we all know, have strokes with greater morbidity and a higher risk of death. And uh, unfortunately, although we have great therapies uh, with respect to stroke prevention, in up to 40% of cases, uh, the AF-related uh, stroke is actually the patient's first manifestation of their atrial fibrillation. So uh, that is an opportunity lost for stroke prevention, and this is why later on in the talk we'll talk about the value and the potential merits of atrial fibrillation screening, uh, but it's clear that uh, detection and management of atrial fibrillation uh, is key. Just some numbers across the world. Uh, Atrial fibrillation is clearly a disease which increases with aging, and as our population ages in various uh, countries, this grows. 0.5% uh, of the overall population is afflicted with atrial fibrillation. That's over uh, 33 and a half million people. And this, with the growth and the aging of our population, is expected to double by 2030, uh, such that in the uh, United States alone, uh, this could represent up to 12 million people. And please keep in mind that these statistics are based on the types of atrial fibrillation that we typically uh, see 
uh, patients coming into eMERGE, ECG detected. This does not even account for the large number of patients in whom, if you were to implant a monitor or put them on some type of continuous monitoring, would have short-lived atrial fibrillation picked up by these devices. That number is actually many-fold larger than what we propose here. So it is a very important public health uh, issue. It is increasing with age. It is associated with stroke, which is uh, very important to this uh, uh, assembled audience here today. It's also a very uh, strong marker of uh, heart failure, which is an emerging uh, uh, line of inquiry in atrial fibrillation. And uh, so it is, it is quite an important condition that we really need to uh, address. Now, age, you know, I always tell my patients, uh, you know, one of the big risk factors you have for atrial fibrillation is getting older, and, you know, we don't want to stand in the way of you getting older because that's a good thing. Uh, but there are other modifiable risk factors, of course, that we can address. Physical inactivity, excess weight, excess alcohol, smoking, hypertension, diabetes, uh, and other cardiovascular disease. And these are um, well-described uh, risk factors, not only for the development of atrial fibrillation in the first place, uh, but also AFib-related complications like heart failure, stroke, and death. Uh, these are potentially modifiable. We've not focused so much as a cardiology community on uh, trials to address the risk factors for atrial fibrillation, although these are starting uh, to come into vogue. Uh, where we've really made strides, however, in the past 20 years, surrounds uh, stroke prevention through the use of antithrombotic agents. So some policy, because uh, this is a policy session, if we look at the 27 EIU report looking at uh, stroke uh, prevention, uh, we can see uh, several statements. First of all, uh, healthcare systems uh, need to be the foundation of risk reduction, uh, and this involves some tricky tasks like motivating people, uh, training healthcare providers, and addressing the underlying risk factors. Uh, healthy living policies, uh, you know, seem obvious, uh, but uh, these policies are often at conflict with other goals of government and uh, both national and regional. Uh, guidelines are great. We, we do develop guidelines. They tend to be evidence-based, and in the world of atrial fibrillation and stroke, we have a, a really solid evidence base upon which to write guidelines. Uh, but there is always a difficulty translating guidelines into real-world world practice, and uh, we learn a lot uh, from uh, implementation studies about uh, what may go wrong when we try to export relatively high-quality data into the clinical arena. Uh, screening uh, for atrial fibrillation, we don't do it. Uh, there is, uh, we don't do it in a systematic way at least. Uh, policy uh, guidelines are quite divided and uncertain on to, uh, as to its value, and uh, we, we need more work here if we're going to uh, take advantage of the potential of atrial fibrillation uh, related screening uh, to reduce stroke. And then finally, we really need to look at uh, comprehensive strategies not only focusing on atrial fibrillation, but other uh, disease entities that go with, such as hypertension being a, a big one in the upper and uh, middle upper income countries. And I think uh, these are just broad uh, guidance statements. Now, screening is probably one of the most uh, uh, topical uh, discussions here in atrial fibrillation and stroke. Uh, there will be several sessions here at this, uh, this meeting, including a couple tomorrow, dealing specifically with screening. Um, you know, if you look back at the wilson Younger criteria published decades ago now, looking at the attributes of a good screening program, uh, you can see here uh, that atrial fibrillation uh, fits the bill for something that should or could be effective as a screening program, right? We have uh, ways to diagnose it, uh, even when it's asymptomatic. We have uh, widely available treatments that are acceptable to patients and markedly improve outcomes. And you can read down the list instead of uh, spending five minutes on this, but for most of the things that matter with respect to atrial fibrillation, uh, it would uh, fit the bill for something that should become a good screening problem. Of course, uh, you know, the details of which have yet to be worked out because identifying something that could be a good screening program is a good start, uh, but then you have to uh, develop a program because there are many variables. Which patients you screen, how do you screen them, how often, and how do you plug the screening results into a care system which results in therapy being delivered and strokes being present, uh, prevented. So you can see here, you know, just part of the problem shown on the left uh, from the ERA guidelines, uh, we have many different ways uh, to look for atrial fibrillation from inexpensive uh, methods like pulse palpation or uh, handheld ECGs all the way up to 
much more sensitive but much more expensive technologies like implanted devices. Again, uh, I think you have general uh, considerations. Do you screen the entire population, a subset of the population? Is it population-based, like we go out and we screen everybody above a certain age? Or do you do this in an opportunistic way? We just look if the older individual happens to present to our family practice for uh, whatever reason or to a pharmacy to pick up their medications. So there are different settings and populations that you might screen. You can select patients based on age, risk factors, uh, and you can deploy different types of tools to look for atrial fibrillation. So in lower risk individuals, one might begin uh, to evaluate looking at handheld devices where we're picking up largely persistent and permanent atrial fibrillation. Patients have it all the time. Uh, there is reasonable evidence to suggest that this is a higher risk form of atrial fibrillation with more absolute risk. And of course, when we're talking about screening studies, absolute risk is a very important thing when we <clears throat> try to determine uh, the cost effectiveness of our, of our strategy. And so you can see there are a lot of variables at play. If you do the permutations and combinations, there's literally hundreds of ways you can go about screening. Uh, that's not the point. The point is, A, we need to study these, and B, these screening strategies need to be tailored for individual regions because what works in southern Sweden may not be so applicable in the southwestern U.S. for two random examples. So I think these uh, screening studies all show that you have to plug in the results of the screening into a care system uh, to deliver therapy because simply identifying the atrial fibrillation alone uh, will not prevent stroke. Uh, my friend and colleague uh, Martin Rosenquist and his group in Sweden uh, did this very nice uh, population-based study called Stroke Stop where they looked at 75 and 76 years old individuals. This was population-based. They pulled people out of a national registry, invited them to participate. Uh, the Swedes uh, in these two counties in Sweden were very agreeable since more than 60% of them agreed uh, to come in for a random screening using twice daily for two weeks uh, handheld ECGs. Uh, they found a lot of atrial fibrillation and they, they estimated, they calculated uh, that the cost uh, per quality adjusted life year would be somewhere in the neighborhood of 4,000 euro. Uh, so that is an assumed cost. There's a lot of modeling that goes in. However, uh, based on these results in a fairly aged population, uh, they felt this uh, could be cost effective if this was introduced. And you can see, you know, this has been looked at uh, not only in the medical press, but here in the lay press uh, from the, the Economist, uh, where they look at, for example, on the left-hand side, screening for blood pressure. You see a lot of uh, variation between countries in terms of uh, how many uh, patients over the age of 40 are screened for hypertension. Um, you know, these are self-reported, or these are physician-reported questionnaires rather than uh, national-level data. So take the results with a grain of salt, but you can see uh, there are uh, a fair uh, range of responses between the different countries. Uh, and the same is true for atrial fibrillation. Again, self-reports, so there's some outliers here like China and Russia, uh, where I'm not sure uh, that 42% of everyone in Russia is screened uh, for atrial fibrillation. I think that's probably not true. But uh, suffice it to say, when you ask people in the various countries, uh, the overall rates tend to be low, and there tends to be heterogeneity between countries. So the challenges moving forward with screening, there's several things. First of all, we assume uh, that screening uh, prevents stroke based on modeling exercises. So all the studies which have been done so far look at detection rates as the outcome. Uh, there have been a few studies which are grossly underpowered uh, to look at uh, does screening actually prevent stroke when you measure that directly. Uh, there are some much larger tr uh, trials in the 50 to 100,000 patient range which are ongoing now to address these issues. Uh, but so far, the state of the art in AF screening studies is looking at AF detection rates using different populations, different screening methods in different settings. The second big challenge is, the, is government agencies. So uh, there have been a lot of high profile um, uh, government agency rulings on AF screening, most recently the USPSTF in the United States, uh, where uh, they have stated uh, that there is incomplete data uh, to recommend screening and they generally do not advocate uh, for atrial fibrillation screening uh, of the general population. You can get similar responses uh, from Sweden and other countries and uh, you know what in 
general they are asking for is more evidence that this is important. And there are a variety of reasons for that we can discuss in the, in the question period. Uh, but, uh, you know, what they are looking for is direct evidence uh, and reassurance with respect to things like false positives and the cost of downstream confirmatory testing. And then finally, as I mentioned before, and I'll show some specific examples in a second, uh, we have some difficulties translating that AF detection into treatment, right? If we look at surveys and registries from across the world over the last five to ten years, you can see treatment rates in quote-unquote good countries of somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of patients who have atrial fibrillation on their ECG in clinic. Uh, those 60 to 80 percent of those patients are treated in good countries, in, uh, in countries uh, where treatment is not uh, well done, you see rates as low as 10 percent. And these are patients that have atrial fibrillation or are coming to you specifically for this problem. Uh, so if that's the benchmark for atrial fibrillation as a diagnosis, uh, you know, when you're rolling this out to screening people who are not complaining of the problem and who you're seeking out to look for a disease, uh, you know, it's hard to imagine we can expect across the world for better results out of the gates. Uh, but I think with continued research, continued education, and policy initiatives, uh, we can get there. Uh, but it is going to be a journey, and we can't just assume that if we start screening everybody in North America that we'll get 80% of people on therapy. That's just uh, overly optimistic. So recommendations, uh, I think, um, you know, these fall into very broad categories. Uh, we do need to look at atrial fibrillation prevention. For most of us in upper income and middle upper income countries, uh, this, this is boiled down to hypertension, obesity, alcohol intake uh, would be the big three, and many things like sleep apnea that stem off of those three. But if we want to address this, uh, you know, we, we do well to combine our efforts, uh, like with the Heart and Stroke Foundation, with other initiatives like hypertension, right? Hypertension is the big cause of atrial fibrillation in North America, and it also causes stroke, even independent of atrial fibrillation, and so that is a natural fit from a policy recommendation perspective. Uh, screening, uh, I think we are starting to get it right with doing trials of the, uh, the uh, required magnitude uh, to address some of the concerns of, uh, of uh, regulatory bodies, uh, but these, uh, these are works in progress right now. And then management, again, we have come a long way with the introduction of uh, anticoagulation therapy, and uh, we are uh, uh, now uh, at a point where we can go further with the introduction of DOAX and with the introduction of, uh, of uh, knowledge translation strategies through government agencies and uh, through professional societies. So with that, um, I'm going to stop. We'll take our questions together as a panel all at the end. Uh, but it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Trudy Loban up uh, to talk about public awareness for atrial fibrillation, uh, which really steps off from what we've just discussed uh, here right now. So thank you. Thank you, and thank you all for joining us today at this important and different meeting. I'm Trudy Loban. I'm from the UK, but I founded and I'm the CEO of the AF Association, which is a global organization. Why did I found this? Well, I have a daughter who was diagnosed uh, when she was very young with an arrhythmia, so I set up the STARS Syncope Trust charity. In 2005, I launched Arrhythmia Alliance globally after we successfully changed government policy in the UK. And by 2007, 51% of our inquiries were related to AF. So Professor John Cam, who many of you may have heard of, uh, the world leading expert in AF and our president, we searched the internet and at that time, there was no information for patients and the public on AF. So we launched the AF Association. So I have a daughter. My husband died 10 years ago from sudden cardiac arrest, and both my parents have AF. My mother suffered an AF-related stroke a year ago on her 88th birthday, and my father has had bleeds. Thankfully, they've both survived. But uh, often when I give presentations at the end, people always say, what drives you? What's your commitment? So I've started saying it up front. 
family, the hundreds of thousands of patients and carers we hear from, and the desperate need to do something about AF-related stroke. And knowing that in the majority of cases they can be prevented, then we must do something. These are my disclosures. So what do AF patients face? Well, first of all, they're challenged to diagnosis. Often they're told it's palpitations, it's just getting old. This is all from a survey we've carried out. So it's important that we ensure healthcare professionals take this seriously. Then the lack of awareness of AF. Even now, it has improved, but we still have a long way to go. For some, they have debilitating symptoms, breathlessness, exhaustion, mentioned the palpitations, even fainting. For others, there are no symptoms. Complicated, ineffective, and unequal access to therapies. And for some, the risk of a devastating, debilitating, and all too often fatal AF-related stroke. And of course, there's a psychological impact. Some of the surveys that we've carried out, this was with 5,000 patients. We have a database of approximately 60,000 patients. And you can see, I won't go through every single stat here, but the, the symptoms that they, that they include, and a staggering 30% of those diagnosed with AF were under 60 years of age. So it's not just a condition that affects the elderly it can affect younger people as well. We've even had someone as young as 21. That's rare, but it does happen, and they find it even harder to find a diagnosis. The challenge to diagnosis, the length of time from being first aware of symptoms, if applicable, to diagnosis varied widely from just a few hours for the lucky ones, and in some cases over 30 years. All too often, the diagnosis is only achieved after they've suffered an AF-related stroke. 10% of those surveys had surveyed either a TIA or a stroke, and then they had their diagnosis. And 90% of AF patients had never heard of AF before the diagnosis. If you don't know something, you're not likely to do anything about it, so you will continue if you're obese, if you're drinking too much. And this is why greater awareness is desperately needed. Then there's the access to treatment. This was 500 patients that we, we surveyed. So you can see some received no treatment at all. Some had cardioversion with drugs, some electrical cardioversion, some a cardiac device, and a few ablation. And yet, where necessary, they should all have access to appropriate treatment. 30% of AF patients noted that their healthcare team didn't understand all of their needs. Now, you have to remember, a lot of elderly patients may have a cocktail of things going on in their drugs that they're taking, but we should still address the needs of the individual. The NHS, the National Health Service uh, in the UK, can address these needs, but it is the time. We know how busy the doctors are, how precious those minutes are when you're seeing your patient. So that's where we need to ensure their support. Maybe AF-led nurse clinics, um, AF nurses who also have a good understanding of stroke. Maybe a combined clinic with AF nurses and stroke nurses. Of the 119 patients with documented chronic AF, 37% were unaware that AF causes clots. 47%, that's nearly half, were unaware that AF can lead to stroke. And 48% were unaware of the reason for anticoagulants. And all too often, people do not adhere to their anticoagulants because it doesn't make them feel any better. So I've still got the symptoms, doctor. This drug isn't working. This is why I first introduced the... Uh, description AF related stroke, not prevention of stroke in AF, not AF leading to stroke. We need to get the public, the patients to understand that AF can be related to stroke. And if the physicians refer to AF related stroke to their patients, the patients will begin to hear and understand. 
All too often, people calling our 24-hour helpline will say, I've been to the doctor, I've been to the hospital, I went about palpitations in my chest, and he talked about stroke. He wasn't listening to me. You have to remember, a lot of these people never heard of AF, obviously not medically trained, and they're scared, they're emotional, and they're not hearing what the doctor's saying either. So we have to do something about this, and that's why I urge all of you to talk about AF-related stroke, so that patients put two and two together, and you need to take your anticoagulant to prevent an AF-related stroke, to help them adhere to their medications. 65% of AF patients are concerned about having an AF-related stroke, while 40% are concerned about the risk of developing heart failure, when they understand that there are those risks. And while many patients reported needing, needing better information on AF management, approximately 30% of patients recognised the need for better information on AF-related stroke prevention. And I think it's our responsibility and your responsibility to ensure that we give them that information. They can take away a piece of paper and we provide cards with all the contact details on so they have somewhere to go and find that information. You can't possibly keep a stock of all the information that's available out there for patients, but some simple business cards on your desk and hand that, the patients have somewhere to go or their uh, sons and daughters can look up for them. So what does the AF Association offer? We make sure that we are providing with them timely and accurate diagnosis by signposting them to the experts, by providing checklists for them to complete and take to their doctor and discuss with their doctor to prompt questions. Reliable and helpful information. All our information is written and reviewed by our medical advisory committee then reviewed by a team of volunteer patients before it ever is published. In the UK, it's endorsed by our Department of Health, and in the US, endorsed by the American College of Cardiology. I would love to see a stroke association also endorsing this information so it can be handed out in stroke clinics as well as cardiac clinics. Support and understanding to manage the worry, the fear, and the debilitating symptoms, and easy access to appropriate therapy. We have a dedicated website which holds up-to-date information on all aspects of AF, including AF-related stroke. Our helpline offers information and support to those affected by or actually involved in the care of people with AF. And we help establish local support groups around the countries or in other countries, offering local support and information. And we host an annual patient day in the UK, and we're planning one in the US, and we'd very much like to see one happening here in Canada. Uh, last Sunday, at the beginning of the Heart Rhythm Congress that we organise, uh, on the Sunday is patient day. We had 525 patients and faculty from all over the world coming to talk with these patients, including uh, clinicians from Canada which we are so grateful for. These patients are desperate. They're so thirsty for information. We also provide information for healthcare professionals, whether it's through reports, taking part in research, and our Heart of AF website, dedicated purely for healthcare professionals. We host cardiac update meetings, attend sessions like this, as well as our annual Heart Rhythm Congress. We also publish annually our AF Association Healthcare Pioneers Report, where at the beginning we chose 10 centres. Now we open it up and people submit their case studies, uh, setting best examples, best practice. And we have an international panel of judges. And uh, our latest 2019, the winners will be announced uh, in November during AF Association Global AF Aware Week. This document is now being used by policymakers, by clinicians, by funders, by po uh, the politicians passing on to the health minister. It's become a Bible to refer to. If you've set up a service and you want to improve it, you can reference others. If you're thinking of setting up a service, you can go through this and choose what suits you. But it certainly has become the place to go and see where all the different services are being offered. 
and again it's endorsed by our government. So talking of governments, we do a lot of advocacy work in the UK, throughout Europe, and we're beginning to do some in the US as well. We also have set up an all-party parliamentary group on AF, bringing together politicians from various uh, backgrounds, all with an interest in AF. This enables us to access the health minister, to reach out to the policymakers. It's not just the patients and the clinicians asking and demanding, it's also the members of parliament asking why aren't these services available. And we're looking at setting up a caucus in the US as well. And importantly, raising awareness. We launched a few years ago the Know Your Pulse campaign. It's so simple. In fact, it's too simple because all we're doing is teaching people to know their pulse. It was launched by Sir Roger Moore, the late Sir Roger Moore, who was a patron of ours, and he also had AF. And we have a video where he's there taking off his watch saying, James Bond may need a Rolex. Roger only needs three fingers to take his pulse. <laughs> so that draws people in. But we host these events around the world. Our president in China took 750 physicians out into the provinces teaching people know your pulse to know your heart rhythm. Last November, I was in T Times Square in New York. We host events in parliament, in shopping centers, um, in hospitals, yeah, anywhere, we, even in schools. And I was invited to one of the poorest schools in Monte Video, Uruguay, teaching the children to take their pulse. I don't speak Spanish. But they all understood when I said, does your heart go boom, 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 or is it boom, 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 boom. I've had reports back from the president of the Uruguayan Cardiac Society that a nine-year-old girl, because they were set homework for two weeks, they had to take the pulse of their parents, grandparents, or elderly neighbors. A nine-year-old girl went home and found a boom, 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 in her 46-year-old father, who's now gone on to be diagnosed with AF. Is it screening? We call it awareness, case finding, because screening's not yet approved. But we know from our results, which have been published and presented um, as abstracts at various international meetings, that we are detecting more people with AF with a simple pulse check and the handheld mobile monitors, uh, working with pharmacists, with the cardiologists, with stroke experts, general practitioners, and with the public. Know your pulse to know your heart rhythm. Such a simple message, and yet it can save lives. We organise the AF Association Global AF Aware Week, inviting everyone to participate. Host your own event, put up a poster, uh, whatever it might be. We can provide all the materials, you can create your own. And we have our Detect, Protect, Correct. Detect AF by a simple pulse check. Of course, it's more than that, but you need to do something to draw the public in. We always advertise free pulse checks. The minute somebody sees it's free, they come over and they want it. Protect against AF-related stroke using anticoagulation therapy. We often put in brackets, not aspirin. And again, people will come over and say, well, I've got AF, but my doctor's prescribed aspirin. It's a great time to start a discussion and provide them with information as to why aspirin is not recommended to reduce AF-related stroke. And of course, we must remember to correct the irregular heart rhythm with access to appropriate treatment. Please note that I refer to anticoagulation as a therapy and treatment for correcting the heart rhythm. Again, this reference back to what the patient and the public understand. If you prescribe anticoagulants and say, this is your treatment, they think it's going to make them better. And they don't understand why, if they experience symptoms, they don't feel any better. So therefore, as, long as, you know, as well as recommending AF-related stroke, I also suggest anticoagulation therapy and receiving appropriate treatment. And if we manage to detect, protect, and correct, we will perfect the patient care pathway. Three easy steps leading to a good outcome. 
Any of you interested in the AF Association Global AF Aware Week, it's held the third week of November every year, and I'm very happy to send information. We have lots translated into various languages. And these are just some of the events held uh, last year throughout the Awareness Week. Arrhythmia Alliance also hosts the World Heart Rhythm Week the first week in June. This year we focused on fa Take Fainting to Heart. There is no such thing as a simple faint because the STARS charity, which I originally founded, is 25 years old. And AF patients often faint. And again, it's something that should be alerting their doctors. So that message, take fainting to heart, know your pulse, to know your heart rhythm. If the public were aware of these, hopefully more of them would seek a diagnosis. And again, just some samples in India, in China, New Zealand, Canada, America, and across Europe and, of course, the UK. You can see it's so easy to get across a simple message, and it can make all the difference and save lives. And I just want to read very quickly uh, Restoring a Patient to a Person, because at the end of the day, nobody wakes up wanting to be a patient. And the minute we wake up feeling unwell, we want to get better. This particular patient says, I understand that AF increases my risk of stroke. My clinician has involved me in the decisions around treating and managing my condition and supports me to access the best quality care to suit my lifestyle. I feel empowered to take control of managing my condition with the support of my healthcare professional. I have sufficient information and support to help me ask the right questions and manage my condition effectively. I know I'm not alone as I can network with other patients. I feel op optimistic and hopeful for the future, thanks to support from the AF Association. And that's what we should be doing for all, giving them that information, that support to restore the patient to a person and avoid disabling, debilitating and fatal AF-related strokes. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Kessa, I believe, is next. <laughs> Thank you very much, Trudy. Thank you all. So um, I will speak about the collaboration of cardiologists and neurologists. So these are my disclosure. And as you well know, the, the stroke is, has a major burden on patients, caregiver, and we are expecting more than 70 million uh, stroke cases around the world. And unfortunately, there will be an increase in the low and middle income countries. And unfortunately, stroke is not the case, it's not only a cause of uh, stroke in elderly patient, but it's a cause of uh, um, it's also a cause of disability in patient in working age. So it's something that we, we probably all feel from our daily practice that the age of our patient is going down and we see how often we see the stories of patients who were working and then come to our stroke unit and then to have reinvent their life, to restart their life, which is challenging of in, at the age of 50, 60, when you are really uh, struggling with the less of your, you are less physical fit and you have to deal with the consequences of, of stroke. And it's, it's clear that 20% uh, of our stroke patients are, 20% of uh, stroke is due to atrial fibrillation. And unfortunately, atrial fibrillation is not only a major stroke cause, but also is um, a cause of more severe stroke and has a higher recurrence rate. So these are conditions that are um, in mind of our patient. Uh, especially uh, you have a higher risk of tra hemorrhagic transformation. So it's a, a stroke type which we have to deal uh, and we have to elaborate all kinds of secondary prevention treatment which are not so straightforward uh, like atherosclerotic, um, atherosclerotic stroke. 
But stroke is also some, it's connected to the heart. And you, I always say it's a fatal um, attraction between heart and brain. It's not always, it can be a very healthy um, relationship because heart and brain need to work together. But sometimes they create a kind of fatal combination. And stroke, especially when, when the brain is ill, also the heart will suffer. And we can have dysfunction like atrial fibrillation, heart fa um, failure, congestive cardiac arrest, and atrial fibrillation. So there is a cascade of, um, of factors which lead a, a, com a, a re recitable, a, 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 um, a, a co-mechanism that make the heart suffer and the brain suffer. So normally, stroke is in the domain of neurology. However, we need, and we knew from our daily practice that the collaboration with cardiologists is crucial. How many times I, uh, I have to call my, my friends from cardiology and vice versa when they have complications during their procedure. It's something that we, we are almost working together. And many times in my life, I thought to have a second specialization in cardiology. But then, you know, um, stroke being a stroke physician is such a busy job, so <laughs> unfortunately I did not have the time to do it. But, uh, and this is not only because atrial fibrillation or other cardiac cause lead to stroke, but uh, we need cardiologists in the, in the uh, management of the risk factors before stroke. We have, to, we have to refer to them when we have not only atrial fibrillation but hypertension. And also during the, the acute phase of stroke, as I showed you, there are complications, cardiac complications, so there is a lot of collaboration. And we need them also in the collaboration of the post-stroke care. And they need us many times, unfortunately, because how many times you are called in, in, the, in the cardiology ward due to neurological complications. So it's a very tight collaboration day by day. But um, we know that, um, that, however, the acute management, and this is something that is proven, is, is normally done by neurologists or, uh, let's say, stroke specialist, because uh, stroke needs to, ne needs to have a very deep knowledge of the brain. So, and, and cardiologists tend to, to, to manage more the complications. So in order to this, to say uh, what happens in our normally day life so that we collaborate with the cardiologist, we said from the European Stroke Organization and also from the European Society of Cardiology that this collaboration needs to be structured. And you know that the European Society of Cardiology's, uh, Cardiology has founded the Stroke Council and the European Stroke Organization has founded a Brain and Heart Council. In order to have a very direct and not a competition, collaboration between cardiologists and uh, stroke specialists. And uh, during the mini, uh, meeting in Munich, there was an informal meeting, and you can see here the photograph where, let's say, the main points of collaboration were discussed. And um, we had a meeting in March this year where we, where we said, let's, let's understand what are, the com what are the points where we really have to, um, to work to, together. And what we put, and this is a paper that has been to, uh, submitted to a AHA, uh, to the European Heart Journal, so where we uh, wanted to understand and uh, to validate the burden of atrial fibrillation and other um, Arrhythmia. We wanted to define all the conditions which are on higher stroke risk. We also wanted to understand like fibrosis could be part of this, um, uh, let's say, in the pathophysiology of, of stroke. And uh, we wanted to understand, and this is something for the future, what could be the, um, the detection of atrial fibrillation with uh, variable technology and if this uh, detection enables the initiation of treatment. And we also wanted to understand when and how to start anticoagulation. You know, my university, Perugia University, performed a rough study where we defined that the best time to uh, start anticoagulation is between 4 and 14 days. So this is something that we are uh, carrying on. And I think also here, this is something that we need to, to, to discuss with our colleagues from cardiology. So uh, also, 
because stroke uh, landscape is so much changing, we have to, def uh, to understand if there are new emergent risk factors. So this is um, probably there are conditions that are not known. Think about of 20% of cryptogenic stroke. We are still do not know why 20% of our patients have a stroke. And often we have an embolic pattern. So we have to understand. And I think there is really the collaboration with cardiologists will be something that changed for, will give us no more insight in this. And we need to understand the bleeding, uh, high risk bleeding scores. So, uh, as you know, uh, I worked, I, I was the president of the European Stroke Organization, um, and um, during my, my tenure, I decided that one of the most important um, action that I have to do together with Bo Norbig, who was the chair of, of, this, uh, of this plan, is to understand and to, to write a European auction plan of what should uh, stroke care be in Europe. And this, was, this cannot be done only by physician. We needed the patient organization on board, so SAFE, the, the Stroke Alliance for Stroke, is on board, where we designed what should be the most important goal for stroke until 2030. And you know, this is in line, not only you don't have to, in, in science, it's difficult to invent the wheel. So it's something that we is, uh, decided to do this together in line with the WHO Europe NCD ancient plan. And we wanted to see, we looked what the NCD's um, plan has done in, in the past. So it's everything is in line with the sustainable development. And this is a really personal, uh, um, let's say, advice. I think we should should all look, especially in health and our lifestyle, not to the every kind of excess that will will probably um, if, we, if we reduce all the excesses and have a sustainable development, this is something we will reduce, reduce uh, pollution. We will reduce. We will create better health care. So uh, this action plan was, is divided in seven main points. We included this time the primary prevention, which is new for stroke because we always started from the acute treatment. We were very good in delivering acute uh, treat, uh, treatment, and now we have excellent uh, treatments like thrombectomy, thrombolysis, and so on. And then we said, no, we cannot. We have to start from the beginning. We, the best stroke is the one that, we never, that the patient will never experience. So we have to start from here. Second, the organization of stroke service. You know that stroke is the most time-dependent disease. And everything we do, it's much more, as in cardiology, we are strictly dependent on time. Then we have the management of acute treatment, with the, uh, treatment re secondary prevention, the follow-up, which is, you know, how many patients are after being in a fancy stroke unit are lost in translation because they feel abandoned. Rehabilitation, evaluation of stroke outcomes, so understand which are, who are delivering and which centers and how to deliver quality of care and life after stroke. Again, what I said before, how many patients come to a fancy, wonderful technological stroke unit, but then they live together with some, with the residual uh, disability and they feel lost. And we have to care with them because we know that stroke is also a cause of dementia and we need to protect this patient. We need to, to integrate them again in, in, in the life, in the normal life. And uh, we have also a domain on the research because a lot of things still has to be done on hemorrhagic research, on hemorrhagic stroke. We have to still, there is a, a widespread need on stroke research. So uh, why we decide to do this? Also, this was done by SAFE. The, um, SAFE did a wonderful report on the burden of stroke in Europe. And what you see is that hypertension is only controlled in, 20, in, Europe, in Europe in 20 to 40%. We have still smoke, too much smoking. We have not enough physical exercise. And there's not enough uh, awareness, and you heard this very well from, from Tudy, about atrial fibrillation, who, who should be treated, and how to detect it. So it's, a, it's still a lot of uh, unanswered questions to, to, to be answered. So regarding primary prevention, because I will focus on this uh, more than the other target, we, we, put, um, we put some targets to be reached. And what we want is to have a uh, universal access 
to primary preventive treatment based on improved and pe be, uh, personalized better risk protection. And especially, you know, it's very easy to define high risk patient because we, everybody of us knows what is a high risk patient, but the moderate risk patient, they are something, sometimes lost in translation. And we have to fully implement the national strategies of multi-sectoral public health intervention promoting and facilitating lifestyle. Again, what I said from the beginning, sustainable development. Do its, we have to change our attitude to the, the, it's not against our way of life, but a little bit less, a little bit less of food, forget the smoking, and do a little bit more uh, exercise. This will generally uh, protect us and our patient from having vascular disease. And to have more screening, and treatment programs for stroke risk factors in all European countries. And what is even much more important, this is to have 80% of the patients controlled, the hypertension controlled in 80% of the, of the patients. Again, um, regarding secondary prevention, and this is much more where I am in charge because I see patients in primary prevention. You know, our outpatient clinics now are full of patients who have ischemic lesion, asymptomatic ischemic lesion. So these patients come to us and sometimes we say, oh, look, it's not, this ischemic lesion, the silent ischemic lesion is are important, but start from stopping to smoke, control your hypertension, and so on. Look, check your pulse when you have, based on the European, uh, stock, uh, European Society of Cardiology guidelines, check your pulse after 64. So take care of, your, of yourself. So we have this kind of patient, but we have more secondary patient, secondary prevention patient. And what we saw, we did a survey in the European Stroke Organization, where we wanted to understand how the secondary prevention is delivered in our country, in our countries. And you see, unfortunately, Europe is, but like every continent, because we have rich part of Europe and we have weaker parts of, of uh, Europe. And you see there is a, a east-west gradient. And there is especially difference in life, lifestyle management programs. There are not all the TIA clinics, which are demonstrated to work. We don't have them in all over Europe. We don't have, um, we have limited use of evidence care. We have limited use of blood pressure monitoring. And we have limited use of long-term AF monitoring. And this is even more important when you talk about secondary prevention, because we know that there are embolic patterns, and sometimes we are sure that our patient has atrial fibrillation, but we could not detect it. So we have to, we have to continue to search for it. So this is something that it's not and probably everybody know, knows in your in in knows how to do, but not uh, what to do, but not how to do it, and how to push also the stakeholder to get more uh, more um, resources on stroke prevention. So these are, uh, for example, the affected investigation that uh, that we want to do have for the future. So just to um, just to conclude, we have overarching targets for for 2030: reduce the absolute number. We are very ambitious by 10 percent. Treat more than 90 percent of patients in the in the stroke unit. Have national plans for in passing the entire chain from primary prevention and uh, through life after stroke and to implement all the national uh, strategy. So at this, uh, we had a, to do this. We have to go for more than, we have more, what, you, what we don't want is only to have the, another declaration. We need an implementation plan. And we did already have um, a plan in, 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 in ongoing, so we will conduct, uh, conduct the gap analysis, we will prepare an epidemiological report, we will estimate the resources that are needed, so in order we will understand how to best implement the action plan. And here you can see the timelines. So we have the first target review in 21, mid-time review, the term and uh, review of targets in 27, and in 2030, we owe 
the stockologist and the patient and all the stockholders to a, a report of what we try to do in, in this in this years. Thank you very much for the attention. <laughs> now it's my pleasure to give the word to Patrick Lindsay. Thank you very much and good afternoon and welcome to Canada for those of you visiting from far away. I have um, no disclosures for this talk. I work at the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada and I'm not receiving any financial reimbursement for being part of today. So what I want to discuss in a few minutes is the AF situation in Canada, how we've been driving our advocacy and policy through evidence and um, a multi-pronged system change approach and then to talk a little bit about the impact. So in Canada, atrial fibrillation affects over 350,000 people and one in five um, people are admitted to Canadian hospitals with stroke have atrial fib. There is a major challenge in physicians who are reluctant to adopt the new therapies and Trudy mentioned, did speak eloquently to that. Especially the biggest issues are some of the newer therapies with a relatively short um, evidence history. We don't have long-term outcomes, we don't have long-term knowledge. The safety profile has prompted recommendations in many guidelines, ours, the Europeans, the Australians, to um, recommend DOACs as first line of treatment over um, other treatments, yet within our public um, pay system, so we're a public pay system, but we're not national, we have our health system um, financing for health systems managed at the provincial level. And there's all kinds of restrictions being put on who can order what for who when. Some of our biggest evidence in our advocacy work has been through capturing the attention of the media about people at risk. So this year we had a major campaign where we focused on women. So for years we've heard about women and heart disease and all the disparities about women and heart. There's been very little information out there about women in stroke. So when we put it out there and really focused on the fact that women live longer, have strokes at a bit older age, and atrial fibrillation becomes a major risk factor for stroke as you age, and that women with atrial fibrillation related stroke do poorly. They do worse, they have worse outcomes. And so we really highlighted that in our report this year and we had phenomenal media attention. The, the, People, um, it was all new to people, they didn't hear about it. But what's equally alarming is when we looked deeper um, at the research studies, all of the major research studies underrepresented women. And that's been a real challenge because the media kept coming to me saying, why are they doing that? It's like, it's not that anybody's doing it intentionally. There's a whole complex set of reasons why women don't participate in research. Whether they're childbearing age, or whether they tend to be more risk averse than men. So there's all these complex issues making the challenges of atrial fibrillation um, increased. So some of our own work in Canada, when we looked at stroke, and this is a study by um, Gordon Jewett and Amy Yu and, and myself and a couple others, we know that ischemic stroke, as everyone knows and was mentioned earlier, accounts for the greatest proportion of stroke. Yet when you look at AF, it's a um, significant um, predisposing event in both hemorrhagic and ischemic stroke. What we know is that the proportion of stroke admissions with a comorbid ex coexisting atrial fib diagnosis has steadily gone up. Mortality is going down. We are hoping that's because of better detection, better, more aggressive secondary prevention, and we're still trying to understand um, what may be related to that. But what, what really pushes people, what really pushes the advocacy is cost. Atrial fibrillation attributed hospital costs are huge. And the, these are cost projections that were done a few years back, so they're much higher now. So money does get attention, and we've been using that. Um, in terms of what we're doing for policy or for advocacy and systems change, which is a big part of our job, is first of all we had to understand how atrial fibrillation was being managed within a stroke population. So we actually looked at stroke prevention clinics. They've kind of been the big black hole. We didn't know where they were what they did, so we did a major um, survey a couple of years ago where we asked all the um, hospitals that do stroke care, 
Where do you send your patients? What are your prevention clinics? We gathered the list, very long list, called it all out, literally phoned everyone we heard about to figure out what they were and who they were. We then did some geospatial mapping. So what you can see here is um, the location of all our prevention clinics. But there's an issue. So if someone comes in with a atrial fibrillation attributed TIA and they happen to live in an area where the stroke clinic only runs two half days a week and bad you, your stroke was the day after. You know, they run Monday and Tuesday and your stroke was on Wednesday, which means you're not going to get evidence-based um, guideline care by getting seen at a clinic. So this has sparked us in some of our work to work with our system leaders across provinces to start having dialogues. Can we bypass the local regional um, prevention service and go to the next one that actually offers more hours if our patient is in that situation where they need to be seen within 24 or 48 hours according to evidence-based guidelines and the clinic in the area can't serve them. And what's even more interesting is we did some work looking at crossing borders because as you can see for some of our rural areas and anything in pink isn't getting served at all and anything in those yellowing and beigey oranges aren't getting served at all. So we've been starting to have conversations about well you know if they can be seen in the province next door because they're like 10 minutes away from the clinic, there just happens to be a line drawn on the road somewhere saying you're different provinces, is that possible? And then you get into all these issues about who can pay and, and physician insurance, but we've been working through those. So those have been some of our major system change. When we ask some of these clinics, well, what do you do? How do you detect, how do you um, screen your patients? And we found out that, you know, if you look at the Holter monitoring, the most common um, first-line er, investigation is people aren't getting access to it in any timely fashion. Patients have to come back. Now, you have to appreciate if you saw it when you saw the map of Canada, some people travel two, three, and four hours to get to a prevention service. And then if they're told you have to come back next week to get your halter, a lot of patients choose not to because it's a hardship for them. They've had their stroke or they're at risk, they're elderly, and a lot of our roads in winter aren't passable. And for a lot of people in the summer, they're not passable because there's a big body of water in front of you and you have to wait till it freezes to actually get over to where the services are. So there's all these complications to our issues. When we looked at prolonged cardiac monitoring, access right now is low and we've really been able to use this information. And we actually have this at provincial level, so we've been playing a little bit of you know, competitiveness. We've been showing one province, hey look, the province next door is able to do this, why can't you? And that's worked well for us. So when you look at our guidelines, the Canadian Stroke Guidelines talk about detection and very clearly the steps involved. And we're starting to build the evidence for that. You know, a lot of our work in Canada, we're, we've been fortunate to have some really um, prolific AFib investigators that have been incredibly helpful to us. That's only one piece of it. We also have to look and promote the enablers. So monitoring, all those things that might impact what, what you choose to do and how you do it. Education, we heard very clearly from um, the AFib Association the need for patient education, the need for supports, the need for family support in this. So we've been trying to build all of these pieces into the work we've been doing. So how do we effectively drive system change? First of all, we have to have champions. And because of the way our health system's built, they need to be local. We need to look at engagement, advocacy, and the systems and structures that exist and be able to bring in expert advice on how those might need to be changed. We need to work on knowledge exchange and exploitation through the guidelines, through learning activities. We pro, um, provide a whole series of stroke best practice webinars for health professionals. And not only do we present them live, but we also then make them available afterwards. And we've had you know, many, many thousand um, views of, of all of these webinars over the years. Public awareness is another major issue. People don't know about AFib, as we've heard. But then the real crux is the measurement. Show them the money, show them the numbers, show them how poorly they're doing, show them how many people are coming into hospital with stroke, show them the cost of that. We really profile those elderly ladies who are all living on their own and quite proud of that. And then they had their stroke. And it was an atrial fibrillation related stroke. And then they happened in a nursing home. Twice as many women with stroke than men in Canada end up in a nursing home after their stroke and a big chunk of those women have atrial fibrillation related stroke. So those are major challenges and it costs more. So when we start putting those out in the media saying how come this is happening, we get a lot of attention and then we bring it to our policymakers. So within the policy side of things, we have a very specific 
um, process that we use, and this is um, compliments, and I want to acknowledge our very amazing policy team at Heart and Stroke with, with Manny and Gavin and um, Leslie and uh, Megan. They've been great at helping me put this together. So we have a process for how we deal with issues at a policy level. We identify the problem. We you know, collect the evidence. We understand the position. We have to do a risk assessment, right? We have to know what is the appetite, what is the current interest in these kind of issues at the government? Who else is in this field? What are they saying? You know, who can we partner with to amplify the message? Who do we have to be careful of? You know, and an example not related to this is, you know, Canada's undergoing a whole food guide revision. And the food industry is not so happy with us, right? Because it's gonna hurt some of their food and their um, revenues in some of the things being promoted in the new food guide. So we have to know who the enemies are, who the naysayers are, who's holding the power weight, and who we can um, partner with to get to the point of actually being able to put policy statements and active advocacy into play. So advocacy, policy, and engagement are our three areas. Patient and public engagement, as you heard from the atrial fibrillation society, is such a powerful piece. When we go to sit and talk to government about atrial fibrillation, about stroke, about heart, we bring patients with us. We have them tell their story, and the power of that in the room really makes a difference to whether we're being heard or not. So bringing that patient voice, and it's not that we're exploiting them, having them there. This is their issue. They're living with it every day. So hearing the real story, rather than us trying to interpret it, makes a huge difference and gets the attention of those that we're speaking with. So just to bring it back to home and finish with the patient perspective, because that is the whole point of all we're doing, is Lynn, this was from that report I told you about that we did in the spring. Lynn is a 77-year-old. She's a physiotherapist. She has dealt with stroke patients her entire life. In her retirement, she offers water yoga therapy to stroke patients. She's in the change room at the pool, just finishing a class, and she drops and has a stroke. And it's a natural fibrillation-related stroke. She didn't know she had AFib. She's been working with stroke patients and educating them her entire life. And she had a natural fibrillation-related um, stroke. And she didn't, she knew, um, she had been diagnosed with AFib, but nobody ever told her that that's a risk of stroke. And this is a well-educated physiotherapist who wasn't told by her physician that her atrial fib could cause her to have a stroke, and she wasn't being managed properly. So these are the stories that wake people up, that get them listening, and then we can you know, slide in our policy and our advocacy messages. But we have to get the ear first, and this is how we've been doing it, by telling the real stories and then telling them how much this is costing, but also providing solutions. So other things we've heard from our patients are a real confusion about atrial fibrillation being you know, a transient state versus a chronic condition. They don't get that it's a lifetime chronic condition. Um, what are the safety of different physical exertion? They're worried about that. They're very worried about medication side effects and interactions between drugs. And they have actually said, oh, you know, I have a panic attack and it makes my heart go weird. You know, I'm sure that's all it is. It's like, no, your heart's going weird and your panic attacks because you're having other symptoms and you don't understand why you're lightheaded and dizzy every time you stand up. So we need to engage patients. We need to give them the tools such as um, our thrombosis um, shared decision tool, which really helps educate patients on how to make decisions about their care and treatment in atrial fibrillation. So the combination of policy, working with partners on that, amplifying the message, being advocates in every venue we can, as well as making sure the patient's at the forefront of all that we do is how we've been able to be successful in moving stroke systems forward and we'll continue to do that. Thank you. lead it off, who is who here in the room, just show of hands, is involved with health policy, either nationally, regionally, or at the local uh, level? Just show of hands. Okay, so it is a minority, somewhere around 5%, which uh, I guess is what I would have anticipated. So this is great that so many people came out uh, to talk about policy. 
uh, and, uh, and because I think it's important. I mean, one thing as a, a person coming at this from a medical background, um, you know, we, we have our chance to help patients improve the life of patients, and this is, this is what we do day in and day out, but it's, it's really critical that uh, those with expertise and a variety of different expertises uh, step up and, and become involved in policy because as you can see here, a lot is being done, a lot of help is needed, and uh, this is how we really make big important change which uh, impacts the lives of many. Um, so maybe I'll kick it off and there's microphones around the room if people have questions, uh, but maybe I'll, since uh, Trudy's conveniently located to my left, uh, start, with, uh, start with Trudy because you, you, you work at this on a global level. Uh, what have you seen around the world that's been particularly encouraging in terms of a really great practice that certain country or region has implemented with respect to AF-related stroke, and I do like the term. Uh, have you seen any, um, any best practices that you think should become contagious? I wish I had lots to choose from, but sadly it's not the case. There's still so much work that needs to happen, and it's organizations like um, stroke associations and AFib association where we have to deliver these policies. We identify the problem, we need to offer up the solution. And uh, 15 years ago when I was talking to our Department of Health, they actually said, we like working with you because you don't just come in and bang the table with a problem, you also offer a solution. And I absolutely agree, you have to lead with the patient stories, real life stories, and you have to engage with those patients. And I think the best way of changing policy is asking the patients and their carers, their loved one, to write to their politicians. And you have to provide them with the resources to do that. So we will draft the letter. If they choose to add their personal story, that's great. Uh, we even give them the link to their local politician. They then send that to the politician. But then we also work with the healthcare professionals and ask the healthcare professional to write to their politician as well. Again, giving them a letter. Make it as simple as possible. Google says if you don't find what you're looking for within three clicks, you give up when you're on the web. It's a bit like that when you're trying to get through to the politicians. You need to make it simple and simple for people to do. And we've done that, and we've ended up changing government policy because of it. Just letter writing, which well, these days it's email, but otherwise it's a piece of paper, an envelope, and a stamp. And I think by engaging and demonstrating and offering those solutions. So it's beginning to happen. Uh, I was really pleased about two months ago, I got an email from the Australian government. About four or five years ago, we did Know Your Pulse in the Australian government. They stopped proceedings and they all lined up uh, to have their pulse checked. They emailed me two months ago wanting to know, could I go back and do it again? I can't pop to Australia, but I've called on some clinicians and their nurses, and they're going in to do it. So it's things like that. <coughs> maybe we'll tackle one of the most uh, contentious parts of policy right now, and uh, maybe Patrice, you want to lend your opinion on AF screening, where we are with this. I mean, we've had uh, patient advocacy groups, uh, professional societies, guideline committees, all. Uh, being very positive around screening. Uh -huh. uh, we've had screening agencies which, you know, take a somber and, uh, you know, careful approach to this, and which we should respect, uh, which have come down with different uh, viewpoints. Uh, where, where do you think we are, especially as it pertains to your last uh, case, that physiotherapist who didn't uh -huh. know about her AFib until the day she had her stroke? It's been an interesting challenge right now because there's big groups, especially in the United States and Canada, the um, American um, task Force on Preventative Health Services have actually not recommended mass screening. And so when you're, when you're getting a lack of support at that level and they're the ones providing direction to family physicians, um, that's been a bit of a challenge for us. In terms of broad screening, it's not, it's not there yet. We need to have more data. We need to have more um, evidence to show the impact both from a financial and on a patient impact and how many more people we would be able to reach and whether and it's not just that but then the follow-through on that and will that make a difference in long-term outcomes and trying to do that trajectory has been a major challenge and so that's where we're trying to push those um, issues 
but we need to pull the data and the AFib data in the community-based settings is really hard to get to support that. Yeah, I think Trudy made a very nice distinction and it, it's a term that I think dates back to Dave Sackett back in the early 70s of opportunistic case finding and I mm -hmm. think there is a, a key, key distinction between case finding and screening. Mm -hmm. uh, and case finding, you know, this might be if you run a hypertension clinic, you know, as physicians and nurses we should be taking a pulse for sure if we're seeing someone for hypertension. Uh, you know, it, it often in a busy day when you're seeing someone for an unrelated issue, although they may be elderly and although they may have multiple atrial fibrillation risk factors, uh, you know, just making sure the pulse is on the, on the checklist or a handheld ECG, a uh, brilliant initiative in Ireland where uh, they were required in their primary care clinics to have uh, defibrillators on site. And so some bright person say, well, if we had to have to have them on site, why don't we hook up everyone over a certain age and have an ECG run while they're waiting to see us? Uh, brilliant little uh, use of technology, almost no cost. Uh, the other great one I saw was the, uh, you know, we all know about is the flu shot initiative in the Netherlands. You get a flu shot, we advocate flu shots, they're, they're great. Uh, and you have to wait around for 15 minutes afterwards to make sure you don't have a rare reaction. Uh, so why don't you go sit in this chair and hold this little stick and it'll measure your pulse while you're waiting uh, for your 15 minutes to go up. But these sorts of initiatives, I mean, uh, we have to be clever with these things. Uh, you know, if you talk to primary care providers or uh, public health workers, uh, you know, there's so much great stuff that we can do. You know, we, we are here for, a, you know, stroke prevention, atrial fibrillation, but there are many things, right, from colon cancer screening to uh, visual acuity to everything under the sun. And the reality is we do overload uh, our primary health care providers will we do this in a linear fashion adding one thing on top of another thing so as much as we can integrate uh, and, and what what lends itself better uh, than you know AF and hypertension right these are the two big drivers of stroke that we can modify in this part of the world and uh, you know why we would keep those disjointed I'm happy to see that groups like heart and stroke and others uh, think of these as a, as an integrated kind of screening because it, it is uh, it is important to uh, you know, when we roll these things out into real world, uh, that they be manageable for the providers. I totally agree with you. Um, we don't call our Know Your Pulse event screening because screening is not approved in the UK or in most other countries. So um, to get the doctors, the nurses, the clinicians on board as well, because they're not allowed to screen, that's why we just say Know Your Pulse. It's awareness, it's education. So until we have screening, and one day we will, meanwhile, more and more is on prevention, more and more is being put onto the public to be aware of their own health. So what better way than to teach the public something simple like know your pulse so they can then go in and say to their doctor, I've been feeling my pulse, and sometimes it's regular, sometimes it's jumping all over the place. So I think that's another way, and that's also putting pressure on the policy makers and healthcare services. That's a brilliant approach. It's no longer screening when the patient shows yeah. up for the clinic and says, yeah. I have a problem, here it is. Yeah. Um, the reality is, you know, we can navel gaze at this as much as we'd like, but the reality is screen is coming and we have to be ready to accept it. It will be done, it is being done. There are millions of people around the world with implanted pacemakers, defibrillators, a loop recorder that got put in because they had vasovagal syncope. Uh, that's all streaming real-time data about atrial fibrillation. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, this is my that's world in the pacing uh, community. Uh, you're, we see these data all, every yeah. day. We need an approach. Everybody else, you can be a primary care provider, you can be a stroke neurologist. Uh, there will soon be millions of people with Apple Watches or, uh, you know, uh, bio-censored t-shirts and these sorts of things, they will turn up. I had a patient 25 years ago, and if I hadn't known the course of my uh, ed academic career, I should have kept it. I can't find the file, but this fellow, his brother had atrial fibrillation, had suffered a stroke. He was an engineer. He was having some palpitations. Uh, he comes in and he says, I think I have atrial fibrillation. I said, oh, okay. What, what makes you think that? And he goes, well, my heart's beating irregularly. Uh, I'm a little bit you know, overweight, have high blood pressure. So I went out into my garage and I built myself an ECG machine uh, out of spare parts. And he brought in this beautiful piece of green plotter paper. He said, okay, this many millivolts, this many milliseconds, here it is, what do you think? Of course it was atrial fibrillation, uh, which he had self-diagnosed with probably the first example. And you know, that's somewhere in my former mentor's uh, archive of paper charts off-site in a moldy basement somewhere in Ottawa. Uh, but it is, uh, you know, a good illustrative example that you know, patients are going to demand this. Patients are demanding this. I mean, 
you know, live core handheld devices and other handheld devices have been around for a long time. Uh, they're fairly well validated. When they say there's atrial fibrillation, you should pay attention because it is highly specific uh, if the device says this is a case of atrial fibrillation. So uh, we need to get catch up. We, we no longer can just say this isn't an important problem and we can just ignore it because it's going to be barreling down upon us within days, really, uh, if, we don't, uh, if we don't get in front of it. So one of the challenges, um, and you, you've articulated this well, is there's a lot of data being collected, but it's just sitting there. And, you know, the wearables and all of, you know, the data that's being generated isn't being put together in a way that we can actually use it to identify patterns. And I think that's coming, you know, the whole, you know, intelligence, the artificial intelligence, the Watsons, the, all of these things are there. What we need to do is get coordinated on the data being collected for atrial fibrillation so that we can use it to start really changing the way that we approach and, and manage this disease. There's a study that's just been funded um, by the NIHR uh, out of Cambridge, UK. I'm, I'm part of that study. Um, Jonathan Mant is leading it, and it's doing exactly that, collecting the data. And also, um, it's going to be screening 120,000 uh, patients. Uh, there's 300 GP surgeries. 200 won't be screened, and 100 will to prove cost effectiveness in the data. But that's another three to five yeah. years away. Yeah unfortunately, but it's a start. <laughs> and, uh, and we do need to collect these data. At the same time, we need to uh, evolve the science a little bit further to understand what are our treatment thresholds and the yep. points where we need to intervene. Uh, you know, if you put a loop monitor in someone over the age of 65 with the typical collection of CV risk factors, uh, within one year, 35% of them will have AFib detected. And if you go for episodes under five minutes, uh, it, it's, much, it's much higher. Uh, and we, we do need some common sense to this. I, I, uh, again, when we're sampling with uh, large uh, screening, or not screening, but when we have millions of people with devices who are measuring their pulse many, many times a day or, or with continuous monitoring devices, and we see 30 seconds, 20 seconds, is that, is that enough? Is that not enough? Uh, we need some better guidance on this. That was a conversation killer. <laughs> <laughs> we finished on time. Yes. I think everybody of us thought of a case like this. So uh, it's, it's something that very, we have the, the other point because we see patients in secondary prevention. So even when we have very short runs and we have an embolic dis pattern of the stroke, we tend to treat them and uh, because you know the likelihood that there is an atrial fibrillation in a patient with previous stroke, it was a, so it means a higher risk profile than I tend to treat, honestly. Hmm. Any questions from the crowd? Right, any, anybody else? Okay. So. Uh, we can wrap it up a couple of minutes early, uh, but thank you for attendance. Uh, it's been a really good session. I hope everyone's learned a lot and uh, enjoy the rest of your meeting in Montreal. Super fun. Awesome.